It's the summer of 1990. In six months' time, Tim Berners-Lee will publish his proposal for something called the World Wide Web. In America, MC Hammer and Vanilla Ice have both topped the charts with songs using bass lines sampled from someone else's hits. You can't touch this. But the stock market has also just crashed. And for the millions of college students who just graduated, they've got a degree, but they can't get a job because the economy is heading into a recession. I tried. I applied for every single opening in my field, but there's just, there's nothing right now. This is the actor Winona Ryder in the movie Reality Bites, in a role said to have helped define a generation. Reality Bites came out in 1994, but the book whose title gave its generation its name was released three years before that. It's Douglas Copeland's Generation X, Tales of an Accelerated Culture. Copeland's book follows three main characters described as underemployed, overeducated, searching for meaning and looking for love in a world of aimless consumerism. These 20-somethings reject the hustle and grind culture. They try to work as little as humanly possible, or choose to work in what they call muck jobs, with low pay, low prestige, low skills, and low care factors. They spend their days in coffee shops and cafes talking about pop culture while writing poetry and music lyrics. And as much as they hate to be categorized, society comes up with a label for them. They're called the slackers. You've got a real attitude problem with Fly, you're a slacker. You remind me of your father when he went here. He was a slacker too. Slackers are often portrayed as being lazy, just hanging around and doing nothing. Are you employed, sir? You don't go out looking for a job dressed like that, do you? On a weekday? Richard Linklater, the director of the 1991 movie titled Slacker, said that's just a cheap definition of slackers. Instead, he said slackers are those who, quote, do what's not expected of them. They're trying to live an interesting life. They're doing what they want to do. And if that takes time, so be it. Fast forward 31 years later, and now let's shift the focus to mainland China. Because the 20-somethings of the 2020s in China bear a very strong resemblance to the slackers of the late 20th century. They're jaded after years of studying hard and finding out the reality of the job market. And if they do get a job, they're not working as hard or they're quitting. Some may call them slacking off, but inside China, this new generation calls it something else. In Chinese, it's called tanping, which means lying flat. It's a slogan, it's a meme, it's a way of life. It's part of China's demographic revolution. I'm Jasmine Se, and welcome to episode four, Lying Flat, Letting It Rot. Let me tell you how a new generation of Chinese people are challenging the values and traditions that have been the foundation of modern day China. It's not a cliche or a stereotype to say Chinese culture values the idea of hard work, whether it's to build your future, beat your competitor, or just to get rich before you get old. But what happens if a new generation of workers starts to question that idea? Back in 2019, an anonymous internet user in mainland China made a post on a global online platform for developers known as GitHub. The post referred to something called the 996 culture. 996 means working from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., six days a week. Someone started a project named 996.icu on GitHub and Chinese developer forum as well. And what they were trying to say was that if you continue to follow the 996 schedule, someday you will end up in ICU. This is Xin Mei Shen. She's my colleague on the tech desk here at the South China Morning Post. And you probably recognize her voice from the many Inside China episodes she's presented. She reported on this 996 story and followed its development as it took over Chinese social media back in 2019. It was really an online protest that erupted after a long time of 996 being widely embraced by tech firms as sort of a 
unspoken rule. And the project went viral pretty quickly. It became a top trending topic at the time on social media. People were starting group chats to discuss it. And, you know, well, it didn't really get any heavy censorship like politically sensitive subject would. Some tech firms did make some efforts to kill the discussion because for a while, the GitHub page couldn't be accessed through some of the Chinese browsers. And this must be the first protest that started via spreadsheet. Can you tell us what happened there? Yeah, so since the ICU project, actually very little has changed because two years later, there was a series of unfortunate incidents where two tech workers at a Chinese e-commerce company died from overwork and one by suicide. And that kind of triggered a major public backlash and kind of brought people's attention back on the issue. So we saw another online campaign gathering steam in 2021 that asked workers at China's top tech companies to put down information in a shared spreadsheet. So things like their work hours, how many days a week they're required to work, and which team they're a part of, so that graduates could kind of use it as a reference when they look for jobs. So that was another high-profile online movement in response to the grueling hours. And this whole 996 protest really became a point of difference between the younger and older generations, right? What happened next? Yeah, in fact, you kind of already see this happen before the 996 ICU project, because not long before that, some tech company CEO publicly said 996 is definitely a good thing looking back after a few years, because If you don't feel this kind of pressure working somewhere, then that company is dying. So stuff like that really kind of pushed the anger to a boiling point. Then we have Jack Ma, of course, uh, the founder of Alibaba, which owns the Post, who in the middle of all this outcry actually called 996 a huge blessing that many companies and employees don't have the opportunity to have. He also said it was precisely that work ethic that made China's tech giants. And that led to another big backlash, of course. So, Shimei, what happened next? Was there any effect on the Chinese working culture? Unfortunately, I don't think there was any victory for the tech workers. And over time, or just general disregard for a boundary between you know, work and your personal time is definitely still prevalent in the country. I think these online movements, what it did do is that it brought public scrutiny on this culture, and it may have helped a lot of workers recognize that, oh, this is actually not okay, but there hasn't been a lot of actual improvements. You still see a lot of complaints on social media, and I would say there's still a tension where, you know, the society is expecting continuous hard work, especially given China's economic situation, and people kind of rejecting the grind. You know, just yesterday, actually, People's Daily posted a video on Douyin, that's China's TikTok. They say that young people should have a, I quote, correct attitude towards work and that they should learn to, you know, shi cool. That means to eat bitter, right? Yes, literally. And you can see in the comment section that people were just not having it. So Shimei, you said that the 996 protest was confined to the tech world, but have you seen it spread to the general public? Yes, you're right. The discussions on specifically 996 has died down a little, but the so-called lying flat and letting it rot are still very much common themes for online discussion, and that goes beyond the tech world. Two years after the 996 protests, in 2021, a man named Luo Hua Zhang published a post on the Baidu Tieba online forum titled, Lying Flat is Justice. Here's what he wrote. Life is just lying down, lying down, and lying down. The 26-year-old was a vocational high school dropout. And after working long hours in factories with harsh working conditions, he decided to quit. He moved back in with his parents, and he spends just 200 yuan, or 31 US dollars, per month. When he feels like it, he'll take up the occasional odd job. One of these gigs was to play a corpse in a Chinese movie. He was basically paid to lie flat. When I say lying flat, I don't mean that I just lie down every day and don't do anything. Lying flat is a state of mind. 
That is, I feel that many things are not worthy of my attention and energy. Luo said that this low-desire, zero-pressure way of living left him both physically and mentally healthy. Since there has never really been an ideological trend exalting human subjectivity in this land, I shall create it for myself. Lying down is my wise man movement. In an era where many people are going online to rant and complain about their personal struggles, Luo was offering a radical solution. Happiness and fulfillment in life don't have to come from hard work, perseverance, or sacrifices. Instead, they can be found when they do just enough to get by. It wasn't a call to action, it was a call to inaction. Luo's post quickly went viral. An army of young workers took to the internet to declare themselves as the lying flat youth. Across the country, t-shirts printed with Do Nothing, Lie Flat Youth became hot selling items. One guy even wrote a song about how great lying flat was. He's singing, lying down is the right thing to do. Lying down means never falling down. My colleagues reporting on this story asked some of these young workers why they became advocates for lying flat. Here's what they had to say. I'll most likely have to work hard my entire life, yet still not be able to afford a house. Maybe it's better to just give up on this goal. I used to like going shopping, especially after working hard overtime to relieve stress. Now, I'm thinking about living a simple life. I'm looking for a job with no overtime, two days off a week, earning 4,000 yuan a month. I don't want to be so exhausted. I'm not going to like high desire, hijack my life, like buying a house, car, or starting a family. During the day, everyone chats and drinks coffee, and at night, we sing together and then rest and sleep. Although I may not be that rich financially, the overall gain may be more for my life. We seem to have woken up suddenly and found a new way out. And what was the government's response to all of this? In October 2021, President Xi Jinping published an article in Tioshi, the Communist Party's flagship journal. This is what he wrote. A happy life is earned through hard work, while common prosperity is created through wisdom and diligence. We need to prevent a rigidity of social class, smooth the path towards climbing up the social ladder, create more opportunities for people to get wealthy, and hence form an environment where everyone can participate in its development, avoiding involution and lying flat. Analysts say this was the first time ever that President Xi publicly mentioned lying flat. This was followed by three days in a row of editorials in the People's Daily, the official newspaper of the Chinese Communist Party. Lying flat is not to be advised, and to win while lying flat is not possible. And of course, the advice to young people was then turned into a patriotic boast of how much better China was at controlling the pandemic. Some countries choose to lie down and adopt the policy of coexisting with the virus, not because they do not want to prevent and control the epidemic, but because they are unable to prevent and control the epidemic. But by the middle of 2022, a new slang word begins to spread across China's internet. Bai Lan. People were no longer lying flat. Now, they were going to buy Lan. They were going to let it rot. Ray Allen, wide open three. Bang! Bai Lan is a term often used by China's NBA fans when a basketball team is losing so badly that they just stop trying to speed up their inevitable defeat. Nine-point lead, 14-point lead, a 43-point lead, although far more cuts into that. These 20-somethings aren't just disengaging from work, they're disengaging from life. This is the generation that grew up listening to propaganda about the Chinese dream, the centerpiece of President Xi's political ideology. Back in 2013, Xi said that young people should dream big, work hard to fulfill those dreams, and then contribute to the revitalization of the nation. 
this ties in with the portrayal of Xi Jinping as the father figure to the nation. This is the generation that was born under the one-child policy. They were constantly under the attention of their parents and grandparents, who had a strong desire for their only child to overachieve, fueled by fear that their child would lag behind the others. Their experience of education involved almost constant extracurricular classes and taking a bunch of exams. From a young age, they were told to get the best exam score, to get into the best university, to get the best job. But the dream doesn't finish there, because then they're expected to buy a house, get married, start a family. And as the only child, they're also expected to take care of their aging parents and grandparents. But having grown up watching their parents get richer as the country got richer, and being told they could achieve the same level of success, or even better, the dream started to turn sour in 2020. That was when the massive real estate bubble, which had seen prices soaring upwards, came crashing down. And of course, there was that other shock to the system, the pandemic and three years of zero COVID restrictions and lockdowns. During the Shanghai lockdowns in the spring of 2022, a video posted to social media shows officials demanding a young couple to leave their apartment, saying that if they refused, the next three generations of their families would suffer the consequences. The man has a simple response. I'm sorry, this is the last generation. Thank you. We were all changed by the experience of the pandemic. And for many of us, life in lockdowns had an immense impact on our mental health. According to China's Depression Research Institute, in 2022, students accounted for more than 50% of depression cases in China. That's more than double the figure in 2019, before the pandemic. And despite being told to move on and get on with their lives, it's had a major influence on how the current crop of university students look at life. Here's what some had to say about their zero-COVID experience. It's taught me not to prematurely set goals because there's a lot of uncertainty in life. I really just want to live in peace. I don't want to step into this chaotic society. I didn't know whether I should prepare for the postgraduate exam or look for a job. I was very confused. It left me with no desire to fight for the future. Now, I just want to live a peaceful life without any ambition. This generation has become disenchanted, disillusioned with the Chinese dream. If they can't meet all the expectations that society has placed on them, why even bother? But is it a real shift in the attitudes of a generation? or just social media angst from people addicted to their screens and oversharing their feelings. I think it is a real thing. This is Rachel, who we heard in the first two episodes. Steamed from, I think, the hopeless feeling running among the younger generations in China in terms of economic recession and the increasing unemployment rate. Running through pandemic, it feels like they are just more natural. They're accepting, they're adapting this mentality without any guilt. And now I think reality hit a little bit harsher. It's become more mainstream. So it also could be interpreted as a form of protest against the whole situation in China. And I, I think it's pretty natural. And the young kids, younger generation than our generation, uh, especially the Ling Ling Ho generation that's born after 2000, is more adapting to this mentality. It's not often you hear the words protest and China in the same sentence, unless it's followed by the words government and crackdown. But that's exactly what we witnessed and reported on in 2022 as China's zero COVID policies and the brutal lockdowns of tens of millions of people in Shanghai finally simmered to a boil. But lying flat and letting it rot aren't your traditional protest. You don't turn up anywhere. You don't march or yell slogans. And that's a kind of revolution that's very hard to put down. 
The movie Reality Bites ends with the handsome young man standing before his female co-star, making a speech about how wrong he was, how sorry he was, how much she means to him. I thought that I would come here and tell you something. And what I wanted to tell you was that I love you. And they kiss, and credits roll. But that's Hollywood, and that was last century. This is China, and this is now. In my parents' generation, people never imagined them being getting married over 30 because most of them get married having kids under 30. But now, because I live in Beijing, so many of my friends were at the same age, we, we're not getting married. The story of this generation, the pandemic generation, the Zoomers, the last generation, is still being written. And a big part of that is a chapter about how they're going to care for a generation that vastly outnumbers them the retired and the elderly, what are they going to do? I wonder that question myself, if my generation would opt to send their parents to nursing home. And I think the stereotype has turned from my parents' generation, where they think send your parents to nursing home is not faithful, is not good for your parents, just leave them to a strange place and doesn't really fit the Chinese culture where all the family live together under one roof. But in my generation, I think nursing home perhaps is more like a vacation house to send their parents. Because China's demographic revolution is also about what happens when the majority of what was once the world's largest population is no longer working, no longer earning, and about to demand much more from a health system which is far from ready to deal with them. That's what we're going to learn more about in our next episode.